Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today to look at some interesting content as we examine Digitising Australia and New Zealand, highlights of online primary sources for teaching and learning. My name is Dot and I'm a product specialist at Adam Matthew, a digital primary source publisher based in the UK. We're going to take a look at some of the highlights from some of the archives that we've partnered with in Australia and New Zealand, but also content that focuses on Australia and New Zealand from other archives. Before I do any of that, I'd like to ask you to take a second to find the chat function. To open up the chat, you just need to click on the chat icon button, which will either be at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on whether you've opened this in the Teams app or in a browser. If you have any questions as we go through the content, feel free to pop them in there and we'll be able to have a look at them in the Q&A session afterwards. When I first started exploring the Australian and New Zealand based content that we have, I tried running a few different searches using a wildcard asterisk at the end to allow variants like Australia, Australian, Australasia, Australasian. I then tried cross-referencing those with another wildcard search to ensure that I wasn't missing out on any New Zealand content specifically. And this is all on our AM Explorer platform, which gives you a single point of access with built-in federated search functionality across our collections. And this search returned 67 different Adam Matthew databases in total representing 20 years of digital publishing by Adam Matthew. And this number would be even bigger if you included our microfilm publications from the 1990s, much of which has now been digitised in our digital portfolio product, Research Source. If you've not come across Adam Matthew before, we're a publisher of digital primary sources, working with archives, libraries and museums around the world, partnering with them to digitise and present their documents. Having these digital primary sources available online means that whereas before a researcher might have had to secure a research grant in order to physically travel to an archive to physically look through the documents they were interested in, with access to an Adam Matthew database, your university's entire research community can access and search through thousands of documents from anywhere. Over the years, we've partnered with archives, libraries and museums around Australia, New Zealand and Tasmania in order to digitise their content to make their brilliant archives available to students and researchers at universities around the world. You can see here some of the institutions we've partnered with in the past in our digital publications, some of them many times across multiple databases. In today's session, we're going to take you on a tour of our favourite primary sources that focus on Australasian history and culture from Adam Matthews' collections. I'll be talking to you about our collection Food and Drink in History, and in particular about Flora Pell's cookbook from the State Library of New South Wales. Then we'll pop over to Research Source and examine some of the sources in Empire Studies, such as Lachlan Macquarie's journals. Next up, we have some fascinating New Zealand content from our collection, First World War. And then my colleague Emma Woodcock, who's an editorial assistant at Adam Matthew, will also be talking a little bit about the Australian content from Sex and Sexuality, Module 2, which was only released at the beginning of February. Plus, we'll look at ways that we've been working with state libraries and how these sources can be used in K-12 learning. Finally, my colleague Martin Drew, the Head of Customer Experience for Cortex at Adam Matthew Digital, wanted to show you the work that they've been doing with the Royal Agricultural and Horticultural Society of South Australia, creating a site to showcase some of the content from the show museum. So let's start off with Food and Drink in History. Food and Drink in History is one of our more recent collections. Module 2 was only published last year, and it represents a key range of food and drink history stories from the evolution of food within everyday life to haute cuisine. Food and drink being something that touches multiple aspects of life and society, the documents in this collection examine the deep links between food and identity, politics, power, gender, race and socio-economic status. The collection observes agriculture and food production, advertising and branding, education, regulation and industrialisation. The primary sources in this collection include printed and manuscript cookbooks, advertising ephemera, government reports, films and many more, reflecting a wide range of food cultures and traditions. We've sourced materials from institutions around the US, the UK and Australia, with the bulk of materials ranging between the 16th and early 21st centuries, but Module 2 also includes the Apicius cookbooks, the earliest of which dates back to the 9th century.
Adele Wessel from Southern Cross University has written both a wonderful essay on Australian food history and culture, and she also wrote our secondary resource, Food Through Times section on Australia, which takes a geographical focus on food history, both of which are fascinating introductions to modern food history in Australia. Until the late 19th century, many of the documents in the collection show a shared British identity in Australian cuisine. Settlers to Australia brought cookbooks with them on their journey from Britain, which often influenced food. The first cookery book published in Australia was in 1864. Edward Abbott's The English and Australian Cookery Book borrowed from a number of other cookbooks, including Modern Cookery by Eliza Acton. This copy is from the State Library of New South Wales. Abbott, who was a Tasmanian landowner, makes use of the food locally available to him. And this was years before colonisers had established cultivation and regular supply lines of food like wheat and sheep. Recipes in this book use traditionally British conventions, but substitute in Australian and local meat like kangaroo, emu, wombats, mutton bird and black swan. I want to jump forward a little in time here and look at Flora Pell's Our Cookery Book. We've picked out her recipe for lamingtons. You'll notice it's a really brief recipe. There's a lot of assumed knowledge there. Assuming the person picking up the recipe book will be a woman and will know the basics of how to make a cake. The book was first published in 1916, 14 years after some women were given the right to vote in Australia. Though when I say some women, note that this still excluded women and men who were considered Aboriginal natives of Australia, Africa, Asia and the Pacific Islands, and they weren't included in the franchise until 1967. Pell is a really interesting character and a proponent of domestic feminism. In a world in which paths other than marriage or domestic service are opening up for young women in Australia, Pell was all about upholding societally conservative gender roles. She advocated for a woman's heaven-appointed mission as a wife and a homemaker. But at the same time, she established a career for herself in the Victorian Education Department. This book was reprinted around 24 times between its publication date and the 1950s. And across this time, Pell oversaw the development of cookery and woodwork centres in state schools around Victoria, usually attached to a local high school. She was integral in the integration of domestic science to the Australian education system. And she was even appointed Inspectress of Domestic Arts throughout Victoria in 1924. This book, Our Cookery Book, became an informal cooking textbook and it was passed between mothers and daughters. As a historical source, it's fascinating, because not only does it attempt to cover the general principles and techniques of cooking, but Pell intended the book to change the status of cooking and eating. She's one of the first Australian cookbook authors to talk about nutrition. In the introduction to our cookery book, you can see she identifies five constituents necessary to build up the body, including protein, fats and carbohydrates. And while I'm not suggesting that Pell was one of the first followers of If It Fits Your Macros, her understanding and knowledge of nutrition was better than a number of her contemporaries, and this is a fascinating example of nutritional history and public food education. OK, let's jump over to a different collection. Research source, Empire Studies. Some of you might know that Adam Matthew began as Adam Matthew Publications rather than Adam Matthew Digital, a publisher of microfilm, and recently we've been digitising our extensive microfilm back catalogue. Research Source is a portfolio product which provides digital access to over 8 million pages of primary source material, from Renaissance literature to 20th century business and economics. I'm going to focus in here on one collection from the portfolio, Empire Studies. Empire Studies includes sources that examine the British Empire. There are materials on British colonial policy, perspectives on life in British colonies, and the interactions between gender, race, class, and empire. A large portion of this collection details the creation of colonies in Australia, and the initial scoping trips that were made by the colonial secretary and other key officials, and these are broken down into three individual collections. Convict Transport and the Metropolis, which includes the letter books and papers of Duncan Campbell, 1726 to 1803 from the State Library of New South Wales. Australia, Colonial Life and Settlement, which includes the Colonial Secretary's Papers, 1788 through to 1825 from the State Archives and Records Authority of New South Wales, and then Empire and Colonial Administration, which includes the papers of Lachlan Macquarie and Family, which are also from the State Library of New South Wales. I thought that we could take a look at some examples from the papers of Lachlan Macquarie. 
In 1810, Macquarie took office as governor of New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land, in place of William Bly. Here we have a copy of Macquarie's commission, appointing him to Captain General and Governor-in-Chief over the territory of New South Wales. This collection features his papers and those of his family held at the Mitchell Library in the State Library of New South Wales. Macquarie's journals, diaries and letterbooks from 1787 through to 1824 describe his period as Governor of New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land. This is an important collection for all those interested in empire and colonial administration, documenting the ways in which Macquarie shaped and administered his policies, as well as the reactions and controversies caused by such actions. They're perfect for researchers and students looking at colonial administration, government, politics, relationships between indigenous peoples and settlers, or legal history. During his period of office, from 1810 to 1821, Macquarie introduced system and efficiency to the government. Under his administration, the outpost grew in population from over 11,000 to around 38,000. Agricultural land increased from 7,500 to 32,000 acres, and the number of sheep and cattle raised multiplied rapidly. Roads, bridges, houses, churches, schools and hospitals were built, as well as parks and gardens. Improvements were made in trade and manufacturing and banking and currency. Macquarie's administration was notable for his liberal attitude towards the emancipists. He believed that ex-convicts, on expiry or remission of their sentences, provided they were well behaved, should be restored to their former status in society, enjoying the rights of free men. It was his policy to appoint emancipists to positions of authority in the public service. But while these papers are undeniably from the colonizers' perspective, they can clearly be used to examine the history of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as well as the actions of those from the colony. I'll give a quick warning for the next slide, which includes a handwritten description of proposed violence against Aboriginal people. Macquarie's journal includes an entry from the 10th of April, 1816, in which he orders a punitive expedition against Aboriginal people. His journal includes instructions to drive indigenous inhabitants out. I have this day ordered three separate military detachments to march into the interior and remote parts of the colony for the purpose of punishing the hostile natives by clearing the country of them entirely and driving them across the mountains. The journal goes on to include in the event of the natives making the smallest show of resistance or refusing to surrender when called upon to do so, the officers commanding the military parties have been authorised to fire on them to compel them to surrender, hanging up on trees the bodies of such natives as may be killed on such occasions, in order to strike the greater terror into the survivors. Seven days later, on the morning of the 17th of April, at least 14 people of the Darawal tribe were killed when a detachment encountered a camp at Appin, near the banks of the Cataract River. While the official death toll was 14, many more are believed to have died. But it's not until the 4th of May that Macquarie's journal acknowledges the massacre at Appin, noting that the detachments have returned after having executed several parts of their instructions entirely to my satisfaction, having inflicted exemplary punishments. All of which seems entirely contradictory to the legacy that Macquarie was later accorded as being one of the governors most sympathetic to the Aboriginal people. We've looked at some fascinating content from Australia, but let's move over to New Zealand here. Those searches I ran on our AM Explorer federated cross-searching platform earlier turned up over 23,000 documents that include either a full text and or a metadata mention of New Zealand. And bear in mind that I've used phrase searching here to ensure that we don't get any false hits for new anywhere else. And these documents are spread over a number of different Adam Matthew collections. Service newspapers of World War II includes 50 separate newspaper titles that were published in New Zealand, and 25 of those were published for units that were based in New Zealand. The interactive map in service newspapers can be used to select titles based on geography. And there are so many published in New Zealand that you can't actually see the country without zooming in. I want to show you some of the content from First World War. There are a number of different participating archives and libraries in this collection, and the Australasian content comes from a number of them such as the Imperial War Museum, but I wanted to focus on some of the incredible documents from the Alexander Turnbull Library at the National Library of New Zealand. One of the things I love most about this collection is its focus on personal experience. 
is not just the official reports or newspaper accounts, but the correspondence, personal letters and diaries that help us to dig into the lives of both those fighting and those at home. It's an undeniable window into the lived experience of the First World War. I can filter down to these using the filters on the left hand side here. If I expand the document types, I'm able to filter down directly to correspondence. And if I click apply, it will apply that filter here. There are nine letters in this document, all from Maori soldiers serving in World War I to Aparana, Tarupa, Nyata. In the First World War, Nyata was highly active in gathering Maori recruits for military service, working with Maui Pomare and other Maori MPs to recruit Maori groups and working to provide land for returned Maori servicemen. Some of these were written from France and some from hospitals in England. The correspondence from the First World War is fascinating. Soldiers were usually forbidden from writing about their positions, future movements, or anything that might fall into enemy hands, but also anything that could be considered harmful to the reputation of the military or criticism of the war. Despite elaborate censorship systems, there are always those that slipped through the net. Soldiers actively avoided it. There were those that sent letters with friends they knew would be returned home, those who waited until they were on leave to use the civilian postal service, these letters used to reo Maori to get around the censors. They slip into it when they complain about the officers. In particular, several of these letters concern complaints against the same captain, who the writers accuse of concealing their money. He was eventually court-martialed for it. We'll now switch over to another group of material, from a similar time. Soon after these letters were written, Norman Hare arrived in the UK. He was one of the most prominent sexologists between the wars. Hare had been studying at the University of Sydney before moving to London, and his papers are still housed there. The entire collection has recently been digitised as part of the second module of our collection, Sex and Sexuality, Self-Expression, Community and Identity. Emma Woodcock, one of the editorial assistants to work on the collection, can talk us through this fascinating content. So, it's a collection of the personal and professional papers of Norman Hare, who was an Australian sexologist and medical practitioner. It includes correspondence with other prominent individuals such as Magnus Hirschfeld and Havelock Ellis, uh, multiple editions of the Journal of Sex Education, which Hare published himself, notes and transcripts from uh, radio appearances and public lectures, appointments and prescription books from when he was practicing on Harley Street, um, and articles and correspondence from his time writing for Woman magazine in Australia. He left his library and papers to the University of Sydney when he died in 1952. So we worked with the university to digitise the collection for Module 2 of Sex and Sexuality. And why is it important for researchers? So Hare was a hugely significant figure in the field of sexology. He was a strong advocate for contraception, birth control rights and sexual reform. Um, and he's seen by some to have helped to usher in more liberal attitudes towards reproduction in Australia and the UK. During the 1920s and 30s, he became the most prominent sexologist in Britain and introduced and popularised innovative birth control methods such as the intrauterine device and so-called rejuvenating treatments like the Steinach operation. The documents in this collection allow researchers to trace his career and his, to follow his interests and his involvement with different societies, groups and movements. He advocated for eugenics and sterilisation, um, and as a Jewish man in the period of the Nazis' rise to power, these interests generated a certain tension, which can be examined and analysed more deeply through the collection. Um, not only can this collection be used to study hair himself and his work and research and interests, and also aspects of his personal life, it's also valuable for researchers um, looking into contemporary attitudes towards sex education, birth control and sexual health in general. Um, so when Hare moved back to Australia at the outbreak of the Second World War, he began writing for Woman magazine under the pseudonym Wickham Terrace. His articles answered readers' questions, um, and ranging from sort of pain in childbirth and geriatric pregnancy to concerns about venereal disease and jealousy in relationships. So as historical documents, they offer really interesting insight into the prevailing public and medical trends and concerns of the time. Um, why have we chosen to include it in this particular collection? So the main reason um, for including the Norman Hare collection in Second Sexuality 2 um, is Hare's prominence and his influence during his lifetime and beyond. 
he remains very well known and is a significant figure of study. So being able to digitise his papers and make them more widely available and accessible was really important to us. We also wanted to expand our focus beyond the USA. So the fact that hair practised in both Australia and the UK means the geographic span of the resource has been broadened by including this collection um, in the same way that including material from the National Archives UK and Sheffield City Archives has, has given us perspectives from outside the US. Um, Hair's correspondence with Havelock Ellis as well and other prominent figures from the time allows us as readers and users of the material to get a really valuable insight into the sort of network of sexologists and other scientists who were active across the globe in the interwar period. And then uh, finally, what's your favourite mm -hmm. item from the collection? This is this is very difficult. Um, I've really enjoyed reading Hare's correspondence with his editors at Woman magazine. Um, he often disagreed with their opinions on copy editing and what was and wasn't an appropriate topic for his feature. But I see um, his correspondence with Magnus Hirschfeld is probably uh, my mo my favourite from a kind of historical perspective. So Hirschfeld. Um, was a very influential German physician and sexologist, and he led the Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft in Berlin. He was renowned for his advocacy for so-called sexual minorities. Um, Herr and Hirschfeld wrote regularly throughout the 1920s and into the 30s about their own work and other developments that were taking place around the globe. They wrote in a mixture of German and English, so it kind of takes some mental agility. But he, as the years went on, of course, and as the social and political climate of Herschel's Berlin began to change, the two began to mention um, things like Hitler Leute and the growing opposition to their respective causes and interests. And this opposition climaxed in 1933, when Herschel's Institute and its books were sacked and burned by the Nazis. Herschel wasn't in Germany at this time, um, and in fact, he never went back. But he and his partner, um, Carl Gieser, who was an archivist at the Institute, they kept in contact with Norman Hare. And these letters uh, sort of remain a fascinating insight into the minds of those who fell foul of the Nazis and their crackdown on so-called immorality. Um, and just into the changing and conflicting attitudes towards sex and morality in Europe in the 1930s. That sounds genuinely fascinating and it also sounds like module two gives us a really interesting global insight to sex and sexuality and um, Emma thank you so much for for joining us it's important to note that these sources aren't just relevant for higher education as digitized primary sources can be used in K through 12 learning as well the secondary resources on our site, such as essays and introductions, are excellent starting points for introducing younger students to history and the social sciences. I'll use Migration to New Worlds as an example here. One of our collections that covers 200 years of turbulent immigration and emigration history. It focuses on the movement of peoples from Great Britain, Ireland, mainland Europe and Asia to North America and Australasia. One of our multi-archive projects, it includes collections from 26 archives, libraries and museums. From the activities of the New Zealand Company during the 1840s, which present thousands of original sources focusing on the growth of colonisation companies during the 19th century, to material on the movement of Indian and Chinese indentured labours from the National Archives, this collection goes on to examine the welfare societies of immigrant settlers, including a focus on refugees and displaced persons throughout the 20th century. Though I have to admit that my favourite part of this collection is the oral histories. The secondary sources in the Explore section are perfect for students in secondary education, guiding them through a particular topic and providing direct links to sources from the sites so that students are able to examine and start the process of analysing themselves. For instance, this essay on the history and significance of the New Zealand Company includes hyperlinks for both the New Zealand Company and Edward Gibbon Wakefield. Clicking on either of these would lead you through to all the documents in the collection that have been tagged with those keywords. But for students who aren't quite ready to look through documents at their own pace yet, the essay also includes individual references to primary sources such as this comparative statement of wages of labour from the New Zealand company. 
getting students to examine the wages and the price of things like bread, butter, milk and sugar in comparison to inflation can help students to understand the ways that people were encouraged to emigrate. At this point, you could ask your students about the language that's being used around New Zealand and what preconceptions seeing these prospective wages might have led to. But these sources can be used in primary education as well. Here's a copy of a guide we made for a state library recently. Using key topics and learning outcomes for the state, the outreach team at Adam Matthew mapped the collections that the library had access to with different sources and tools from digital collections. Each suggestion includes an explanation of the source and ways that it could be integrated into engaging learning. Here we've broken down the four subjects for the suggested four years. I thought we could take a look at some of the suggestions for year six, Australia as a nation. One of the themes for this subject is stories of groups of people who migrated to Australia, the reasons they migrated, their contributions to society. And obviously, migration to new worlds is a great fit for this. Some of the sources that we suggested for this come from Museums Victoria and belong to Setsutaro Hasegawa, who migrated to Australia from Japan in 1897 at the age of 29. Hasegawa's story of migrating to Australia is a pretty fascinating one. He'd worked as a school teacher before migrating and arrived in Australia just four years before the Immigration Restriction Act virtually banned immigration from Asia. Arriving in Melbourne, he was employed first as a houseboy and then established a laundry business. He was married and had children in Australia, and when he applied to become naturalised, it was refused because of the white Australia policy. After Japan's attack on Pearl Harbour, Japanese nationals in Australia were rounded up and interned, and Hasegawa was interned at a camp in northern Victoria in his 70s. Even when he was released in 1943, there were restrictions placed on his movement until the end of the war. He couldn't leave his home without permission from the Deputy Director of Security for Victoria. He couldn't associate or communicate with persons of enemy origin other than his own family. And he couldn't have a telephone or radio which could receive long-range broadcasts installed in his residence. These restrictions were placed on him as it was felt his presence might affect public morale. He was one of the very few Japanese interns who was not deported to Japan after the war, presumably because of his age and the fact that his wife was Australian-born and they had children in Australia. Items of his from the collection put together pieces of his life, and they can be used as guides for younger students in learning about the stories of people who migrated and creating pictures of real people. There are pictures of Hasegawa with his son and his grandson, a copy of his passport and the brown silk pouch in which it was kept, the passports dated by the Japanese consulate in Melbourne in 1897. And these items provide students with a potential direct link through history to someone else's life, asking questions like, what is this? Or how old is this? And who did this belong to? Can start younger students off on journeys into examining why and how people came to Australia and what their lives were like. Just before I hand you back to my colleagues for the Q&A, Martin Drew, the Head of Customer Experience for Cortex at Adam Matthew is going to walk you through the front end and the back end of RAH SSA's new Cortex site. It showcases some of the content from the show museum. And for anybody who hasn't heard of Cortex before, it's a platform developed by the team at Adam Matthew Digital using their experience curating and showcasing archival collections. The platform helps libraries and archives easily publish, showcase and share their own archival material. Hello everyone, I'm Martin Drew. I'm the Head of Customer Experience for Cortex at Adam Matthew Digital. Um, and I just wanted to talk today about uh, the experience of our first Australian customer for Cortex. Uh, this is the Royal Agricultural and Horticultural Society of South Australia. And you'll forgive me if I use an acronym to refer to them during the course of this session. Um, I'll refer to them as RA and HS. Uh, they came to us oh, a little while ago and uh, last year launched a website based around the show museum. Now the show in question is the Royal Adelaide show and the RANHS is the organisation that runs that show that puts it on. I'm assured that the Royal Adelaide show is the biggest single event in South Australia um, and that many South Australians and other Australians too I'm sure will have memories of it, reminiscences of it um, as a show. Now, the point of the show museum site that they've put together is to digitize content from past shows. It's been running for, I think, over 180 years now. 
um, and to ensure that these records are preserved and that they're made available to the public, researchers, family historians, etc., or anyone who has fond reminiscences of the show and wants to see more. Uh, so this site was built by their archivist, Lauren Gobert. Lauren is working part time and pretty much single handed on on putting this together. And so I'm just going to show you a bit today about the site that she has put together so far. This is an ongoing project. They've got lots of content to digitize and to add to the site as they go. Uh, but I'll just show you a little bit about what they've done to date or what Lauren's done to date. Bear with me while I share my screen. I'm just doing that now. So here's the uh, site itself. You can see the show museum here. All Cortex sites are customizable and can be branded. This is the RANHS logo. All these pages can be set up um, and formatted and published however anyone wishes. If I scroll through the site here, you'll see there was a search bar front and center. Uh, there's a nice carousel here running full width. And this has been put together by Lauren to showcase certain images. You'll see that there are controls here available as well. That's to keep this in line with accessibility standards. Every Cortex published site uh, can be WCAG 2.1 AA compliant. So a couple of features quickly are the home page here. Um, again, search bar and advanced search capacity, which Lauren's also linked here. Uh, social media sharing. This is a My Account feature. Now I might just show you this quickly as well. So if I click on this, this is the account available to me as an end user. Um, and it allows me to save searches and bookmark certain images. Now this actually works across any Cortex published site. So you can see I've also bookmarked some content from some others here. But if I remove those and apply a filter just on the RA and HS content, this is just a selection of some um, content that I've bookmarked. You can bookmark either individual files or whole assets. So if you've got a compound object, you can you can bookmark individual files or images from that object. So if I show you there's some nice things here. Um, this would link then directly through to to the RA and HS site. And you can see some of the image viewer capacity here as I zoom in. Now, this is the standard presentation for an image um, on the site with the content here, summary metadata alongside, and fuller metadata down below. And you can see the capacity to bookmark here and to download here. Now, if I've got a transcript, it appears alongside. So I'm just going to showcase um, a different type of content as well. Let's go and find a, an AV file. So here I'm linking to what Lauren's labeled search results. This can also be labeled browse all or browse items or browse assets. This is a, a list of all her content and it can be viewed in different ways here. So list view or thumbnail view. Down the side, if she had other collections, this is all uploaded as a single collection, but if Lauren had this um, differentiated by collections, you'd see collection filters down below here. She has enabled controlled vocabularies here. Um, so she set that up in, in Cortex by format, by subject, and you can filter by these terms here. So I think there's quite a lot of cattle, for example, in here. I can apply that filter and see all, all, all those tagged with that um, term cattle. So controlled vocabularies also allow you to do more in terms of presentation of content. If you'd like to learn more on that, I'd be very happy to um, spend some time explaining. I was just going to move through to AV content though. So let me apply a filter here so I can do this just through, I'm just going to clear subject of cattle. And I've applied that audio filter. Now there's only three uh, audio files here, but I can just go through to one of them. Again, the presentation is very similar. Summary metadata alongside, fuller metadata down below. You'll see the capacity to link out through use of the um, CV terms as well. 
And here's the transcript alongside. Now, for this file, Lauren has created an auto-generated transcript. This is done in Cortex just by pressing a button. And the transcription is available here alongside. You can see it's pretty accurate. It also enables me to search through the whole document. So I've just seen Pony and search that. I can then click on the time coding and navigate to the relevant content. You'll see that closed captioning is also generated along with the transcription. So from a discovery and accessibility viewpoint, there's quite a lot of benefit to actually running that AV transcription within the platform. That's a uh, full text search effectively of audio content. Um, and as I said, audio and video content is hosted and streamed in Cortex. But let's look at full text search across another type of document. So we can look at manuscript here. Now, I believe there are minutes here from the 1850s and 60s. Um, and these are handwritten. So I've just searched minutes. That result is bringing up any hits in the metadata first. So you can see the metadata here. But you can also see results returned on the actual image. So all these hits will show highlighted returns for the results, and I can browse through using this feature on the left or the hits button here. This is a result on page 24, and you can see returning a hit on minutes. Um, but what about it running across other words that we can see here? So for example, we can see Bailey. So let's try a search on that. Right, here are the results returned. We've got 51 hits. This is page two. Let's see if it returned that hit on page 24 that we know we had. This is the correct one. Yeah, and you can see as I zoom there, it's returned Bailey, and this was the minutes that we searched for previously. Um, so again, very nice functionality to aid discovery of content uh, here that Lauren has enabled uh, in Cortex. So that's the presentation of her actual content. But how about the static content around it as well? Now, this is completely um, configurable within Cortex. You can build whatever pages and you can navigate between them how you wish. Again, I'd be very happy to um, show more functionality there when we have more time. But here's just some of what Lauren's put together. Um, this is a static content page that she's just uploaded text and external links to. She's also put in a few text content blocks to effectively create a, a timeline through the history of the, the show. Now, there is more timeline functionality due to come from Cortex, which will enable Autom automatic generation of timelines such as this with links through to content. She's also created a few more pages. So we saw external links here. This allows for a direct external link from the primary navigation through to the show shop. And again, there's facility here to create pages allowing donation and uh, submission of content as they continue to build collections. Now, there's a lot more to add to this site. Um, at the moment, Lauren has, I believe, 119 um, individual assets, uh, but she's got something like another um, 80 oral histories, I believe, and over 3,000 photographs digitized so far. Um, now, that program is continuing, um, and I think there are a couple more collections going to be added very shortly. Um, so there's uh, very much a work, work in progress going on here. But you can see something of what she's managed to put together working on her own 
um, over a relatively short period of time to create a nice site that allows for discovery of this um, archival content that she wants to present. Um, a very quick look at the back end here that's enabled her to do this. This is um, effectively the dashboard on my assets. So this is the dams side of things. Um, and you can see uh, her site showing here, collections, and you can see that she's working on a, a number of collections at the moment. And this is a, um, a record of some of the data and the status of those collections she's working on. She's got incomplete metadata here across a number of assets, so needs to work on those. But she can see what she's last edited and who's done it as well. Um, so a little bit about um, some of the display. If we look at the manage assets, this is kind of the nerve center of the dams. This is where a lot of that work is done. Um, and again, you can see the filters running across different collections, the transcript status. And if you wanted to run OCR, HTR or ABT, it's a simple one click function. So that's a little um, whistle stop uh, view of the dam. Um, and it's working in there that Lauren's enabled, um, been able to put together such a nice looking site. And I'm sure there's a lot more to come on that as well. If you've got any questions about this or about any other work in Cortex for its functionality, I'd be very happy to have a chat. I'm at martin at amdigital.co.uk. Many thanks. There's been so much that I haven't had time to show you in this short webinar, such as the documents from World's Fairs that examine the Australian international exhibitions in Sydney and Melbourne between 1879 and 1889. Or the charts and maps in Age of Exploration. Or the documents from the Maritime Museum of Tasmania in Migration to New Worlds. But contact us if you'd like to hear more about some of these incredible sources. And if you're interested in any databases or services of Adam Matthew that you don't currently have access to, then please do get in touch if you want a free 30-day trial of any of these databases.